The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Let's march ahead into upstate New York and do formaldehyde. But first, there's a what should business do issue that I should have brought up last time. So I'll bring it up now because I didn't. This is super PACs. How many people know what the uh, Citizens United decision is or was? Yeah. So, well, it's more than that. Yep, a few. Let me just walk through it a little bit. So before 2010, basically corporations and unions, well, they still can't, make direct contributions to candidates. Um, they could fund independent organizations that put up political ads, but the political ads couldn't be near elections, et cetera, et cetera. Now, after this decision, they can do essentially anything as long as it's not formally part of a campaign. So if you've been following this year's Republican primary season, there are a lot of super PAC ads targeting one candidate or another. Most of it's negative, and there's a lot of money. The question is, you're the head of a publicly traded corporation. You can now make major political contributions. The corporation can now make major political contributions. Should you? Should you? Or when should you? Stephen, what do you think? Um, I think they should be able to. They're able to. I'm not talking about that. Should they? You're the, you're the CEO of, oh, pick your face. You're the CEO of Apple. Should you, and Apple's got a lot of cash, should you spend some of it uh, to give some of it to a super PAC which has a political agenda that you know, that's all? Um, at the end of the day, I think there is no harm in doing so. So I would recommend or I would potentially do that because um, we have all these different candidates that could potentially move things in different directions, especially for a company that, like Apple, that relies heavily on foreign countries to do uh, some of their manufacturing or some of their new products coming out and other related patents. It could be very favorable for them to see a certain type of political candidate in office rather than someone else. So you would do it where the corporation's interests were direct, likely to be directly affected? Any. Uh, any other reason you might do it? Um, I would also do it as, could also do it in more of a publicity type of thing, where I'm saying that um, we're in favor of this green energy initiative and we would like to <coughs> see um, our candidates supported in that area. Okay, David, you with him? Um, yeah, I agree that, um, I mean, the, the, the overall like, morality of the issue is that as a CEO, I would probably um, donate some money if there was a direct impact, but also, again, for PR, maybe whatever I'm trying to accomplish. As far as the company in general, I think Apple gave money to a political action campaign opposing the gay marriage ban in California. So that's you know, part of the image that they push forward. I think that might have been Apple's regular pack. I don't think it was a super, maybe I'm wrong. I think it was a, the regular, the regular packs, uh, let me describe it. They've existed for a long time. The regular packs are where the executives of the company contribute money. The super PAC is where the company contributes money. There's a big difference, right? One is, one is the executive's own money, executives or board members, and the other is my money as a shareholder of Apple. But if it directly affects the corporation, I take the point. But you do it for publicity, and you do it for a variety of causes. So I'm a right-wing Republican who owns Apple stock. Do I like you giving to a green pack? You don't care. Okay. <laughs> Apple shares, if the, you know, the candy stays in the political okay. stance that we're taking is really that offensive to you. Anybody from the other side of the room? Vivian, what do you think? Sorry, I'm also a little late. I don't really know where we're at. The, the question is, 
Uh, should a corporation, let's say Apple, take a big corporation that has cash, make contributions, not the executives, but should the CEO cause the company to make political contributions? And if so, when? And if not, why not? Should I go for the Reform America PAC that favors Ron Paul or the I forget what it's called PAC that favors Romney or one of the Obama leaning PACs or I think that's a really risky decision to make because of like different interests of your shareholders. So Sh shareholders might not all agree. Right. Yeah. Benzie, you were with in regards to like Apple with exports from or imports from other countries in terms of manufacturing, like it's in the benefit it's beneficial to the company and to the shareholders to maximize value in that way. So like so I think I think it's favorable if they're doing it for the company's best interest. So if it's if it's somebody particularly focused on on them. Ariana? I agree. Um, I think that like even if like uh, the, the company ends up giving money to a cause that you don't necessarily personally support, like as a shareholder, you like I think you should think of your interests separately. So, like you have interest in this uh, corporation, like as pertains to making a profit, and you might also have separate personal interests. And so like if you personally you want to donate to like whoever you think has the right position on gay marriage. I think that's that that's fine, but you should know that the interest in the corporation is purely about making a profit. So if the corporation is supporting um, is supporting a cause that that furthers that goal, then that's fine. But gay marriage probably doesn't have a lot to do with my my uh, earnings as a shareholder. So you, you, you shouldn't be worried about the corporation getting involved in that. Andrew, uh, so uh, one thing about like this sort of. Uh, uh, allowing companies to do these sort of things, I think is that uh, whereas in some situations you can see the merit like directly, say if I'm a bank and there's this uh, there's this uh, candidate that I know is gonna like force me to have like higher standards and all that stuff, I might might want to like uh, go for the other candidate. But I think that having these sort of rules like allows for companies to go like in these like murky territory where you're kind of influencing things you may shouldn't. You probably shouldn't, and like, your uh, you increase your uh, in terms of like. Well, you're arguing maximum. you don't like the decision. Sorry. You don't like the decision. Yeah. You don't so like. What, what I'm trying but to the say decision's that, there. What I'm trying to say is that like, as a as a CEO, doing something is uh, uh, supposedly to improve like the the company's position is is uh, like completely subjective because. They're made, like doing uh, the giving money to uh, can X might be interpreted okay. I'm, I'm doing it because I want him to support this, which is good for my company. But then there are a whole other things that you're doing by doing so that I think is more of a negative publicity than positive publicity, in the sense that you're influencing uh, decision making. Because it might be that you're doing it for him uh, to support action A, but for action B, you also have influence on him, and then. That might be that you don't want to have app, Apple to have influence on what he decides on something else. I've been on the board of a company that had one of these ordinary packs, uh, and the directors and the officers chipped in, and it, we made contributions. This was a company located on Wall Street, and we made and we were a regulated company, a securities exchange. And we made contributions to both New York senators and to the congressman from Wall Street so that they'd return our phone calls. Basically, we're not going to buy influence. If they're not concerned about the fate of uh, companies on Wall Street, then they're in a, a lot of trouble. But to basically get your phone call returned, you make a few thousand dollar contribution. So that's, a, that's different from giving $10 million to support Newt Gingrich. Uh, but so. Marie, you had a point, or you were you were waving? No, sorry. Okay, Jacob. I have a question: Is it possible for an international corporation to contribute to an American politician, or like if it's an American company with, say, foreign executives who are making the decision whether or not the corporation is going to donate money to an American politician? Well, if if they have a if they have a subsidiary that is a U.S. person, okay. So if you have a uh, a subsidiary that has a U.S. charter, then presumably that entity can. You can't, you can't make direct contributions in, 
Well, sorry. They can't make direct contributions to the candidate in any case. The question is, can you contribute to a super PAC? I, I doubt a foreign corporation doesn't have U.S. rights of free speech. So I've never heard it brought up, but I don't think, I think it could be barred. Whether it should be done. Well, I, I, just set up, I just set up a U.S. company if I wanted to do that. Well, could, yeah, in, in which case, could there be anti-American interests like yeah. influencing our politicians? Yeah. So I actually found it, I found it interesting. I looked at, uh, at, there's a foundation called Sunlight Foundation. You can find them on the web. And they looked at who's making these contributions. And in fact, you don't find any publicly held contributions. Uh, I couldn't find any. Um, certainly no company I'd ever heard of is on the list for contributions above 25, 20,000. Actually, it was their cut. Lots of private corporations, individuals, unions, partnerships. The only publicly traded company I could find is Console, which is a coal company as far as I can tell. I don't know them well. They gave $125,000 to a Romney PAC. And you have to ask yourself, why? <laughs> I assume that's a CEO who leans Romney and whose board is captive which is not unheard of, that the board is composed of his friends or her friends. I don't know who the CEO is. Um, so it's interesting that most corporations, most large corporations, Apple, et cetera, are not playing this game, even though by law they can. I just find that interesting, and it has to do with what they think their role as CEO is and how they should behave. As I said, I can only find one publicly traded company. There are a lot of, you know, so-and-so family company contributes, and, you, you know, that's a family company. It's effectively a partnership. So not publicly traded. So it, which is? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That maybe all the companies don't think Romney is going to win, so nobody's putting any money into it. There's a lot of money going in, and what we don't see, um, w if you look at what finances senatorial and congressional campaigns, you will see plain old ordinary PACs contributing, uh, like the one I described, where I want to make sure my phone call gets returned, uh, and I want you to be sure that you worry about wheat farmers, so the Wheat Farmers Association, well, but um, I, it is interesting. Obama has a pack, but they're not sure he's going to win either. Uh, so uh, anyway, we'll come back to, to lobbying and, and contributions. It's more for access than for votes, I think. But OK, yes, Stephen. Uh, just a quick question for the, you mentioned that there were private companies that were still doing this type of stuff. <clears throat> Could it be that some of the public companies are going through those means to make their donations? I, I think, and they've talked about it, that there are some companies that are dummy companies that get set up. Um, uh, but mostly it hides rich individuals. So I, you can't follow through from this website, but if you read in the paper, they talk about trying to track down donors and getting a post office box. So it's a company. It has a post office box. It's legally incorporated. Uh, its documents aren't public because it's closely held, so that's a... That's a mask behind which some rich person is hiding. I don't think it would be a sane thing for a big publicly traded company to hide that way. Because if there were enough money, somebody will find it out. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot. If somebody gives a million dollars and they're hiding. It's a good story if you can figure out who it is. If it turns out to be Apple, it's a scandal. So that's too risky. David? Um, could it be possible that some of the larger companies whose um, financial contributions would make a significant impact in the campaign are companies that would already have access anyways? I mean, yeah. If Tim Cook called up um, you know, the White House and said, you know, if you really need to talk to someone in, in Treasury or something, they could probably get a you know. Yeah, Apple doesn't need to buy access. Um, this mining company may. Backing Romney is not the most obvious way to do it. So I assume that this is just a personal preference of somebody and a board that says, yeah, sure, it's 125000 who cares? We'll just cut your bonus. Okay. Um, 
I, it's it's an interesting an interesting issue of the role of the of the role of the of the corporation, but it's also interesting what most of them choose to do. Let's go to upstate New York and do formaldehyde. Uh, I just told you what it. I just answered that question, so we've lost that one. Uh, what's Darren's issue in the case, Matthew? Uh, he's been part of. But what, what problem is he addressing, or what opportunity is he addressing? What's the? A lot of wasted heat. They're venting a lot of, a lot of steam. And it, what, anything else it does, Scott? Yeah, also, the steam causes damage to the building. It uh, corrodes the materials in the building. And it also causes an ice sheet on the ground, which is dangerous for the employees. Lovely stuff. Lovely stuff. OK, that's what he's got. He has three options to, to deal with these that he considers first of all. Do you call what they are? Rachel? Um, well, the preservation. Yep. Um, it's what was, uh, like liquid. Lithium bromine? Yeah. Bromine, yeah. Um, anybody, got, anybody got the third one? Why? The third one is to uh, speed the, the flow of water. Speed the flow of water through so it just comes out hot. It doesn't come out as steam. Um, okay. Why is he focused on combined heat and power? Why is he focused on cogeneration? What are the issues with the others or the advantage of this in broad terms? Kirsten? Oh, um, the disadvantage for the speeding up the process and producing hot water was that they didn't have a good place to put the hot water, especially in the summer. They didn't want to just dump it into the environment because that might have a to the right. And to just dump it in a cool stream. Yep. Yeah, so they said in the winter it would be good they could heat the building um, without using too much other electricity, but in the summer would be a problem. And the disconnection with the improved red chiller was that it would require a lot more um, infrastructure changes. Okay, so we focused on combined heat and power. Um, did anybody look at this? Is this a. It, it, if it saves money, does it save much money relative to the firm's revenue, to that plant's revenue? Obina. Uh, not really. Um, in terms of, uh, I think, power save or cleaning the water or treating the water so that they can uh, make it soft because yeah, it's usually yeah. typically hard. Um, you save 75%, but that's only like 10000 or $8,000. But this is, they make millions upon millions of dollars. And savings are in the low hundreds thousand. Oh, hundreds, hundreds of thousands, thousands. Yeah. right. If you calculate, there's a, there's a typo in the case where it says, it talks about five days absence being 0.01%. It's in fact 1%, and if you lose, use the other numbers. That plant has an annual revenue of about $5.1 million based on the production numbers they give. You work the numbers, Veronica, good. <laughs> so what I get is that, that the savings would be maybe 2% of revenue the pre-tax savings, to compare pre-tax to pre-tax. Okay, so not a big deal. We're going to talk about whether it's a good deal, and we're going to talk about whether they'll do it. Let me just do a short riff on uh, combined heat and power and waste energy. Um, it's interesting, if you, if you look at the rejected energy versus usable energy by sector, right? So this is waste. Transportation, 75% of what goes in comes out as waste energy. Uh, electric generation, just about a third, and every place else about 20%. Um, and you all know the answer to that, what form the waste takes, yes? Waste energy is usually heat, yeah. Yep, so I mean, it's, oops, backwards, this one, Transportation's tough, because cars are not all that efficient, really. Um, and, uh, but for public transportation, this is a tough one. Uh, residential and commercial, an awful lot of the energy is going into heating and cooling. You can make it more efficient, of course. Um, but it's hard to capture. What's attractive about industrial and electricity is you have high heat, you have large delta T, you have the ability 
to use a big temperature differential. Uh, and that's the whole combined heat and power story. That there really are two basic forms, and the case kind of mentions it. The first is called district heating, where you take waste heat, relatively low temperature from electric generation, and you pipe it around to heat buildings. Uh, the Danes uh, did a lot of this. One of the readings mentions that. It's also interesting, the Soviets did a lot of it. Um, it requires you to have power plants relatively close to offices or factories or homes, so it's not the greatest thing. And of course, it makes more sense in a cold climate. Using waste heat to heat buildings in Arizona is not necessarily a, uh, a, great, a, great, uh, a great deal. We put in subsidies in 1978, we'll talk a little bit about PURPA at some point, that were supposed to encourage district heating. Uh, it, it didn't do much for a variety of complicated reasons. It's generally acknowledged as a good thing in lots of places, but we don't do very much of it in this country for a variety of reasons. The other is electricity generation, and there are sort of two versions. The first is basic combined cycle gas turbine, which is a relatively recent, I, I should be able to date it, but I can't, maybe the 70s, maybe the 80s, generation technology that's sort of how people are building efficient gas plants these days, right? You, you run a combustion turbine, which has a hot exhaust, you recover the heat from the hot exhaust, which makes steam, which drives a steam turbine. Combined cycle, CC. So you've got two cycles working and basically two generation units. This, this can be a very, this is pulled off a of Siemens website, this can be a very efficient, a very efficient technology. And it's this same notion of capturing waste heat. Um, the, all you mechanical engineers know more about this than I do, but Others may not. Uh, and this is the proposal. This is the kind of proposal. This is pulled from the case. This is the kind of proposal that our friend Darren is considering. Uh, it has to do, is, this shows a boiler, but it has to do, as you know, with the heat from that exothermic reaction that makes formaldehyde. So this is what he's considering. He's considering a simple system that uh, takes steam to drive a turbine generate electricity for internal use, maybe for sale. You cool it down, you recycle it, you pump it through. You, don't re you, you, will, you will have to use some water, but you'll pull a lot, of the water, a lot of the water through, and the stuff that comes out will be basically cooling the, uh, cooling the condenser. So this is what he's got. There are a lot of benefits of this kind of system in general terms. You can reduce energy expenses. You can worry. It, it could avoid the risk of um, uh, varying energy prices, a lot of security, good environmental benefits, mom and apple pie. But the question that Darren faces is, is it a good deal? I, I want to mention two concepts that the case kind of puts forward and the spreadsheet puts forward without defining them. And I'll talk about them briefly. So if you've got a vector of cash flows, CT, that's the net present value, right? You just discount all the cash flows. The case talks about the payback period. And the payback period, right, is the smallest time such that basically you get your initial investment back. Assuming there's an initial investment up front and then uh, returns in subsequent periods, you go out as far as um, uh, you need to to recover the initial investment. This is kind of an old, a very old fashioned way of making investment decisions. And the problem with it is stated there because it matters what happens after that time. You know, I tell you that you invest $100 today, you get $50 a year from now, $50 two years from now, the payback period is two years. If that's all you know, that's a terrible investment, right? You've just given me your money for two years. 
what really matters is, okay, what happens after that? What happens after, and the longer the payback, all else equal, it may be the worse the investment, but you, you can have a really terrible investment with a short payback period because it dies. So the case talks about it. I just want to caution you that by any sort of reasonable standard, that's not something you want. To, it's something you want to look at perhaps because it, it may be a horseback way of thinking about risk. Right, after two years, we're playing with house money because we've gotten our money back. Andrew, you have a comment? Good to ask. I mean, uh, that, uh, I, I assume that uh, even though it's not like uh, the best metric to make the decision, it could be a good metric to see like when your cash flows are coming in terms of like if I have something that has a payback period of two and a payback period of 15 years, I just know that uh, like my risk is, uh, I have higher risk in terms of uh, like when I get my money back with the second one. No, I think that's right. But you, you also want to just look at the nature of the risks. If I tell you it's a bond, then you don't worry about it. If I tell you it's a nuclear plant, okay, the nuclear plant has a 20-year payback, but if it runs for 40 years, it's got a high net present value, you're right to say, wait a minute, an awful lot can happen, see Germany, see Japan. Uh, so maybe I, maybe I don't want to do that. But that's, that's sort of the main, the main argument. The internal rate of return is also sort of interesting Okay, you can think about the net present value as a, as a polynomial. Well, it's a polynomial in one over one plus r. Uh, and you can say, well, suppose, are we doing this chocolate? Suppose that this is the net present value. and this is the discount rate, then what you might expect is that as you, if you, if you make an upfront investment, you get returns over time, the higher the discount rate, the lower the net present value. This point would be the internal rate of return. Now, what's interesting about that is that when the picture looks like that, you don't have to get too fussy about the discount rate as long as you know it's below R star. Right? That's what it's good for. It says, well, I know it's got a positive net present value back here. But, so if, if the discount rate's somewhere in this range, but I'm not sure which, where it is, I know enough to know the net present value is positive. But you can have, the graph could look, it could look like that. It could look like that if, you know, at the end of the period, it is a nuclear reactor and we've got to clean it up. Okay, then high discount rates make that cleanup cost smaller in present value terms. Right, it's a polynomial, so the number of sign changes is related in ways I've long since forgotten to the number of real roots. Um, if you have a, if there's only one sign change, you're only going to get one real root. But if you have negative, num negative returns at the end, you can get two. I suppose you can get more than two. The normal thing, and that's what the slide says, is to call the smallest one R star and think that's a little weird. The other thing to keep in mind, again, if you just graph these, You can say, here's project A, here's project B. A has a higher internal rate of return than B, but for discount rates back here, you'd prefer B if you have to choose. If you have limited funds, they have the same upfront cost. Your discount rate is in here. B has the higher net present value, you'd pick it. So ranking by internal rate of return doesn't give you a desirability measure. It just gives you some confidence about, um, uh, it, 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 it allows you to be uncertain about the discount rate and still make a judgment about present value. Okay. 
Questions about those, David? No. Normally, that's not that's how they do it. They say, I don't worry about interest rates. Don't give me any of that fancy stuff. When do I get my money out? All right. And you could see the problem. As I say, I could give it to. I can give you a one-year payback period. That's a lousy investment. That's pretty easy. Give me a hundred dollars today. I'll give it back to you in a year. One-year payback, fabulous. Hmm, not a good idea. So, it's a. Uh, uh, it's hard to imagine, but, but you can read texts in the 50s that are debating the merits of payback versus net present value. And you say, wait, what, how? Anyway, okay, what I want to do, unless there are questions about any of this or general questions about combined heat and power, I want to go to the spreadsheet. Um, how, it, I, it didn't occur to me to ask, because of course this is MIT, but how many of you have played with Excel before? Oh, good, that's what I thought. I feel so much better. All right, let's go there. It, it accords with my priors, but all right. So there we have there we have the spreadsheet. Is that readable more or less in the back? Okay. And let's let's walk through a set of questions. Let's figure out how to walk through a set of questions. Hiram, what's happening here? Turn the side screen on. That's what you got to do? Turn the side screen on. All right. No. Ta-da. All right, this works like that. Thank you. Um, if you walk through this, this, this illustrates my point about depreciation. You get total savings, total expenses, gross margin, that is to say, what does this thing throw off in terms of total savings per year? You can subtract depreciation and get earnings before taxes if you want to, but then you'll notice what happens. They compute taxes and they add back depreciation, right? It appears here and it appears there. Depreciation is a game you and your accountant play with the tax people. So when calculating the after-tax in-your-pocket savings, you have to say, what depreciation do I get to take? How does that affect my taxes? That's it. That's it. If you get faster depreciation, your income is lower and your taxes are lower. Your income being lower doesn't matter. Your taxes being lower does. Is that reasonably straightforward? Because you're going to see this in later life, I'll guarantee you. And it shouldn't be mysterious. It really is. And it's, a, it's an accounting entity. You report it on taxes. Some companies use different depreciation schedules for taxes than for financial reporting, which you're allowed to do to some extent. OK, question. I talked before about the difference between doing things in real terms and doing things in nominal terms. Which is Darren, assuming this is Darren and not, uh, not some uh, uh, Sloan student who wrote up the case. Um, what's Darren doing? Is this a real analysis, a nominal analysis? Is he confused? Chimo, what do you think? I'm confused. Huh? <laughs> I'm confused. You're confused. Okay, say why. Um, I don't exactly understand like how like I would characterize depreciation as nominal real. Oh, you what? I don't understand how I will like characterize it as either nominal real or inconsistent. Like, is this the nominal, like, what things should be, or nominal, like, like interest rate? Well, what I said last time was, if you want to assume that prices don't change in this world, uh, where prices do change, then you'd better use a real discount rate that measures purchasing power. If you want to use the kind of rates you see in the market, those rates are based on people's expectations about inflation. 
so you'd better build in expectations about inflation. What people often do, and it's a mistake, is to use discount rates or interest rates from the market and assume prices don't change. So is he inconsistent like that, or is he consistent? I'll give you a hint. A 10% real rate would be amazing. That would be very, very high. Not amazing. It would be high. Mathura? Mm -hmm. um, Doing a nominal analysis, yeah. Because he, he builds in, he has explicit assumptions about, it, about inflation, and he's got an interest rate that's 2003. That's a, pretty, that's a market rate in 2003. No reason you would know that. But you see, the, you see the explicit inflation numbers and a fairly high interest rate. So he's doing a nominal analysis. It looks consistent. Um, is there any defense in the spreadsheet or in the case as to the choice of discount rate? Sarah? I don't remember there being a very specific one, but I would assume he wanted comparable risky assets on the market. Yeah, he didn't say it, though. There's no discussion of where that 10% came from. After all of that incomprehensible nonsense last time about beta, uh, uh, I was giving you what you ought to do, not what people often do. And he, clearly what he did here was to take kind of a horseback reasonable rate and say, ah, 10%. That's pretty, pretty much in line with cost of capital you see and discount rates you see. You would like him to have done more. This is not necessarily an ideal. Are the inflation assumptions reasonable? Anybody react to those? What do you think? 2% electricity, 2% maintenance, 2% chemicals to be added to the water. I haven't been looking at interest rates on a yearly basis, so I don't know what to compare it to. I'm shocked. <laughs> shocked. I thought Assume that's what people around here did. I certainly do. Um, I mean, these are not implausible numbers, right? I mean, if you look historically at inflation rates, they run in this country one, one, two, two and a half percent. So two percent is reasonable. What you don't see in this spreadsheet, what you might like to see in life, is you might like to see, well, does the choice of discount rate matter? You could check it easily enough. We could put another rate in. Uh, do the inflation assumptions matter? Uh, are these, is the outcome sensitive to these things that don't get defended much? That would be, if you were doing this for real and it was your money, you'd want to do that. You'd want to say, OK, I'm not too sure about those assumptions. Are they critical? Do they drive the answer? If they do, you'd want to look harder. We don't see any of that. We may be missing a dozen spreadsheets in the background, but we don't see it here. Okay, as you read the case, where are there risks on this sheet? Jorge? Anything here that's not certain? You think it's all pretty rock solid. Matthew? Uh, I think something that we I mean, didn't really bring it up when he said that the company or like the NCR product was that the insertion time took much longer or in, even like a day longer, a day's production would you know, set back the, the offset of the cost for another like year. Yeah, we don't see the lost production here, uh, and there is presumably some risk there. What about, and that's related to the installation cost for which we have only an estimate, right? We don't have a guarantee. Rachel? I guess the thing that kind of jumped out to me was I'm assuming that they do get that grant. Yeah. Because like, there's been a lot of calls to talk about getting rid of the ultra rate of energy grants and consequences. 
Yeah, I thought that was, that was pretty bold to say, well, I know the, the text says we're pretty sure we can get this matching grant for 172.5, so we'll just assume we get it. And there's no lost production in here. Shimmering? During, during that time, it was much more reasonable in order to get the grant. I think nowadays it might be much more difficult after the financial crisis, but before then, the, the period kind of leading up to 2007, it wasn't very difficult for a company like that to get a grant. I mean, comparably, if you, I think, yeah, now, yeah sure, that argument is probably fair for nowadays, but not necessarily the case back then. If I were a naysayer, I'd say, do you have that in writing? <laughs> do you have that grant? That's, that's, that's big relative to the to the whole upfront cost, and he didn't, he didn't quite mention that. Yeah. Really, I mean, uh, companies like Tesla and Viscar Karma got like half a billion dollar loans for their uh, I, projects. Yeah, but he, this is a New York State, I don't know this program, or I certainly don't know what this program looked like in 2003. All I know is that the case said, can probably get the grant. I, I would say, gee, I'd really like to know, how does this look without getting the grant? Um, I mean, do we know we're going to get it? Suppose installation, in fact, the installation cost, didn't they say 120, 125, and he said, I think we can get it down to 100? Isn't that right? Yeah. Thank you. I need support. Um, so uh, this is, so we've, I, anything else that's uncertain here that you might want to focus on? Julian. I don't see any removal costs on there. Or, like, removal costs? You mean when, the, when you scrap it at the end? Yeah. Uh, that's a good point. That's a good point. He doesn't talk about, he runs it out for, I forget how long this spreadsheet runs, uh, but he doesn't, he didn't talk about what you, presumably you wouldn't, presumably you wouldn't throw it all away since some of it's pipe. Well, maybe you would. I mean, it's pipe with water, so it shouldn't be, it should last pretty well, but, you'd, but the generator you'd have to replace and the turbine you'd have to replace after a while. You're right, there's none of that. But I guess you could think about, well, the question is, is, is there a disposal cost? Yeah. The question isn't, would you have to replace it, because you probably would. The question is, should there be a negative number at the end? Or could you sell it for scrap? And he didn't mention that. Anything else? OK. Do, do you like his treatment of these risks? Darren is not our favorite person here. Yes? Well, the, the the thing is, we, since we don't know exactly how he came up with that discount rate, uh, and then there's a possibility that he's not really accounting for the risk and the cash flows. He might just, I mean, the discount rate is barely, it's not, it's kind of low, but maybe he, he's, he took that into account when calculating the, the you know, risk premium uh, associated with uh, his discount rate. So Maybe, but is this my next question? Yes. <laughs> Did he use pessimistic figures, optimistic figures, or more or less middle of the road figures? Pretty optimistic, huh? Yeah. Chad, you agree? Optimistic. Okay. Uh, th that's a. It, it's an interesting. It's an interesting presentational choice, right? Because Darren knows all of this. And Darren could just say, well, yeah, I've been a little optimistic, but the 10% is high. Um, this project looks so good on his numbers that the better strategy would be to be pessimistic. So you can say, look, I mean, I was very pessimistic, and it still looked good. He didn't do that. Uh, or he didn't explore. Again, if somebody shows you one of these spreadsheets in later life, uh, or if when you're working for McKinsey, they ask you to make one, for heaven's sakes, think about the central case, think about variations around it. He didn't do that. He took the optimistic case. Um, kind of a surprise. I think what he should have done is, 
Oops, let's get it up there. Yep. He should have been a kind of central of the road. Uh, here's a beta question. So the discounting ap applies to how do we value energy savings? Those energy savings are going to tend to be correlated with the economy, against the economy, not at all. The energy savings, probably two components. One, what's the production volume? And let's take that as fixed for the moment, because they sort of do. You tend to run the thing flat out unless things are terrible. And the electricity price. Which way does the electricity price go with the economy? Brendan. It doesn't vary too much with the economy. I'd say that's more, you know, energy in terms of gasoline and stuff, that's more of a, that varies a lot more with the economy. But. It varies a lot more, but if you have high demand, there's going to be a supply curve, particularly in New York, which is a market-driven electricity system. Yeah, You'll be running up a supply curve. So a little bit with the economy. Yeah, I wouldn't say like a very high beta. No, no, no. Not a very high beta, but a positive beta. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. But the thing is, if he was using the, the whatever, the heat that he recovers for uh, generating more electricity, then maybe that's the case. But he, if he's using heat uh, to sell to people, then you can say that that's something that's fairly, you know, pe that people wouldn't be, be very, like, prices. Like, maybe they can't, like, people will need the heat regardless. But what's on the, what's on the table here is generation. What's on the table is generation, not heat. He doesn't, have a, he doesn't have a scheme to pipe the heat away. He has a scheme to use the heat to run, use the steam to run a turbine. So, point, good point. It's, uh, it's cold in New York, even in, in good years and bad, but, but the electricity price is what's at issue here. You'd value the savings. So, heat. You, you could argue well, you could make. You could argue you should use a somewhat higher discount rate uh, than the firm's over, than the ca cost of capital to the firm as a whole, just because there's a, a positive beta. We'd have to look at the firm. Now, I have no idea. <laughs> Does anybody know anything about formal the formaldehyde business? It's a very diverse group. No one does formaldehyde at home? Okay. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I, I don't have a clue. The, they wrote the case as if you just ran the factory. Uh, they didn't talk about it being cyclical. Uh, and nobody talked about, none of, none of the naysayers talked about much cyclicality. But I don't know. Brendan? Yeah, I mean, I think people are still going to die, so... <laughs> <laughs> it has other uses, <laughs> but it does have other uses, which the case discussed, and I don't remember. But uh, okay, what are the most? What do you think are the most important assumptions in this in this uh, spreadsheet? Rachel, what do you think? <coughs> Tough call, just staring at it, yes? You'd have to go and, and look at, you'd have to do, to answer that question, and I raise it because that is really the key question. If I'm a naysayer and he gives me this spreadsheet, um, I say, well, what did you check? How sensitive is this to the discount rate, to the electricity price, to the electricity inflation? How sensitive is it to variations in the installation cost? Does it matter whether, you're not, whether or not you get the grant? I can't tell here which are the key assumptions, uh, but a little fiddling with this can. Alex? Wouldn't the grant be like the most important assumption because that's like half of your... It's half the capital cost. If you go down, though, to his net present value, you say, well, that doesn't matter because it's 172.5 and the net present value is ginormous, so lose the grant. The, quest the, the, the question is, what assumptions would turn it negative? And he didn't answer that. Uh, if, if it saved less than you assumed it would save. Well, there are a lot of things that will do it. The question is, which are uncertain? That's not the technical. They, they describe the technology as pretty vanilla. So I assume that was not. You're right. That would do it. 
um, if you saved less, if, if the electricity price collapsed, if the discount rate were much higher, in fact, for one reason or another, if you couldn't do the, I mean, you could, you could add them up. What you, I ask this question not because I expect you to be able to answer it, but because you always have to ask that question. Uh, what's, what, what's driving this answer? What's driving this answer? Finally, did anybody see the mistake in computing that present value? Sarah. You started in column C instead of column B. Bingo. Savings as opposed to cost. If you go here, if you go here, he takes the net present value of it's C45, uh, no, the net, yeah, C45, which is here, dot, 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 dot. C45, which is the after-tax net cash flow, that's the right thing, all the way out. But he forgot the initial cost. That's one of the most bizarre mistakes I've ever seen. If you look at, there's the formula, net present value of all the savings. Well, what, he, what needs to happen here, it's got a not available in protected view. Do I trust the contents of the file? Of course I trust the contents of the file. We're all friends here. Uh, what he needs to, oh, I see because I, I erased. Uh, what I need to do here is I need to subtract the initial cost. That doesn't turn it negative, but it did make a significant difference. All right, you see what he did? I, I just, I, it's one of these, you say, okay. Um, he took the after-tax net cash flow, so he went down, added the savings, added, uh, that, that, that's maintenance savings. You got savings on electricity, maintenance, and chemicals, which gets inflated. Um, all these get inflated. You'll see the inflation rate coming in here, coming in, coming in. Adds them up, subtracts the required maintenance, gets the net, gets the gross margin, so to speak. Subtracts depreciation to get the impact on earnings. That'd be the increase in earnings. Gets the taxes, adds back depreciation, uh, does all that. Row 45 is the right row, net present value, forgot the initial investment cost. That's a bad move. That's a bad move. Okay, Darren is not doing real well here. Um, did anybody see, anybody look at the payback? Or the internal rate of return? Uh, Sit down. To go back to the assumptions, you're also assuming that for 10 years your production of formaldehyde is going to stay the same. He's making that assumption. Um, and we don't know how sensible it is because we don't know much about the formaldehyde market. Um, they say that they run the plant 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and it's a highly automated facility. And he's assuming that'll continue. Um, it's not clear what other assumption you ought to make. But you're right. That's a key assumption. If the plant shuts down or goes to one shift, those savings figures get cut. Uh, I meant the actual science. Hmm? I meant the science. Like if, if your delta E is less or stuff like that. Like if, you have, if it's less exothermic and they develop a catalyst. Stuff like that. Well, you could, you could do it, right? I mean, if it's proportional to throughput. In the case, it explicitly states that the board mainly cares about production of formaldehyde as a behavior. Yeah. Use of electricity. Uh, I'm not sure I get it. What you're, they, they mainly care about formaldehyde, and he's assuming that we're just going to keep running it flat out because the board cares about production. Uh, I mean, if the market dies or if there's a plant problem, that won't happen, and you just cut the savings proportionately. Well, you'd cut the savings on electricity and chemicals proportionately. I'd have to think about maintenance. Yeah, okay. Um, internal rate of return, how did he do that? It's ROA. 
um, and the formula is up there. You can tell it's an internal rate of return because that's what Excel calls the formula. Uh, and if you look at it, it's, um, and 15% is an initial guess, it's, a, it's an iterative procedure. Um, it's B49 to R49, so it's the pre-tax, it's the internal rate of return on the pre-tax cash flow, which, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you take into account the effect, effect of taxes? If you looked at that, that's weird. You should do it up here, um, and we could do it. I haven't. It's going to be significant, but um, that's just strange. That's just strange. And just for humor, you really have to look at the formulas in the spreadsheet. That's, he didn't actually compute the payback per that slide I did. He didn't actually see when you get your money back. He, may, he, he went up here and took the installed cost, divided it by the um, C21 minus C29. Um, yeah, divided it by what amounts to G30, uh, to C32, divided it by the annual savings in the first year, but the savings differ year by year. So it's just a very, and he doesn't consider taxes. So this is a good looking spreadsheet and what astonished me when I looked at it was, wait a minute, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Otherwise, pretty good. Otherwise, pretty good. Any questions about the spreadsheet? Okay. Let's leave this. No, I don't. Let's go away. And let's go back. So, I just put the spreadsheet with the formulas in the notes. Those are the issues we've talked about. Now let's talk about, let's see, let's talk about the naysayers. So I'm guessing, I haven't spent my life doing this spreadsheet, uh, but I'm guessing if you run through all of the things that we've talked about, you know, the basic assumptions look okay. Um, the, um, Numbers, he's too optimistic, but his, his discount rate's probably a little high. So I'm guessing that if you fiddle and diddle, you will come to the conclusion that the, it does have a positive net present value. First objection, you are now Darren, folks. First objection, if it's such a great idea, how come nobody else is doing it? And your answer is, Obadiah, what do you say? You're going to just take that? You're not going to just take that. What's your answer? Might be we're smart. Might be this is a chance to take a leadership position. Charlotte. It could be that like, the reason they're considering this is because they do have all that excess heat and steam that's coating a plant and maybe other people's plants are designed in a way Could be, although it sounds like a standard problem, the way they describe the basic reaction. You just dump this stuff in a vat and you get it gets hot. Martha? They might not have the same issue with ice. They might all, yeah, and the ice is kind of a big deal. You're right. If you're, if you're in the middle of the desert and nobody can see you venting a lot of steam, you might just say, of course, if you're in the middle of the desert, you may have a water problem. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, I, actually, I think my, my response would be this is an opportunity to show leadership. Uh, uh, I, I, but let's try the next one. What's your answer to that one? This is what I, what, what I got is I estimated the, the, the revenue. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I love, your, I love your net present value. That's just swell, but 
there's a risk here. There's always a risk here. Um, yes, there's always a risk. We talked about outage. We'll come back to outage. But I mean, it's 2% of revenue. You're going to make the plant more complicated. And if you're lucky, we'll save 2% of revenue. Why should we do that? It's going to be lost in the noise as production varies, as price varies, as everything varies. Why should we complicate our lives? Now, these kinds of things come up, Sam. One, you can say the whole, you can play the whole green angle, like it's a good way to make the environment better. But also you can say about like in the future, we don't know what's going to happen with the price of electricity. And if it rises, it's a good insurance policy we have. And also you can say that, you know, the technology that we're adding has a pretty good track record. Like it's not that complex. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is not the first time this contractor's ever done it. So the risk is, doesn't, sound, doesn't sound like it's that high. 2% is 2%. Not bad. Anybody else? Ryan? It's not actually changing the uh, formaldehyde process, so it's not complicating it in that respect. There's also the safety issue, and like you said, the uh, green issue. The safety issue being like the ice drying. Yeah. Got the safety issue. That's a risk. Boy, somebody slips and falls on that ice, and uh, we, get, we get stuck with uh, nice negligence, big medical bills, sympathetic plaintiff. It's really depressing. Scott? So I think if you look at it in terms of the percentage, it doesn't sound like very much. They're saying, like, oh, it's only 2% of our revenue. That doesn't sound like very much at all. But if you say, oh, it's $300,000 we're saving, then that's like... While it may be only a small portion of the revenue, three hundred thousand dollars is a large amount of money to pretty much anyone. So. <laughs> to a five million dollar operation, I don't know. Maybe, yeah, yeah. It's not trivial in the absolute. Anybody else? Uh, um, they're also gonna use current employees to run the same thing. So I presume their their uh, salary would increase. Uh, I wouldn't want to presume that. I would. I'd, I'd say their job satisfaction would increase because it would make their jobs more interesting. That's, that's, the, that's the pitch I'd use. And it's a good point. You might want to see if you can get them behind it. You might want to talk it up. So you can say, well, I've talked, it with the, talked up with the folks in the factory, and they actually like the idea. Everson? Having those same people who are working in the factory doing these extra things, I think it would eliminate some risk because you're more familiar with the process. That helps, yeah. These people know it. They, they want to keep the plant running. We all want to keep the plant running. Um, this actually is a common. I mean, the, these paraphrase the, the objections in the case. I've added a little bit of what you always hear. This is another one. We can invest and grow capacity as opposed to this complicating investment. And we want to grow the business. You're not growing the business. You know, if we didn't have money, well, then we wouldn't invest. But if times are good and we're selling this stuff, we want to make more of it because that's how we grow. And your investment isn't a growth investment. James. Well, maybe by selling electricity and formaldehyde, you're diversifying the uh, so yeah, we're 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 reducing the risk of our operation overall because of this electricity hedge, and that means growth is safer. You might try that. Yes. And you might argue that it gives you experience with the technology that's more PR friendly in the sense that you have less flue and gas. You're building up. It's easier to build things wherever you want because you get less public output, and so that. The ability to grow more in the future. Yeah, of course, except, I mean, we are making formaldehyde. We, we, can't, you know, we, we can't make it into, into flowers, Chimo. Yeah. Um, I think maybe finding like a better solution to get rid of the steam could allow you to uh, increase capacity. Because, like, if it's just like, lying around, there's probably a maximum amount of formaldehyde that you can produce and have the steam creating ice. Or that's, a, like that's an interesting thought. So you're, you're saying we can only do so much of this venting and ice and so on, and this, th that may someday be a constraint on us. Yes, 
finding like a better solution like that might be might me uh, make them enable them to expand it even more. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this process Roughly year three, yeah, extra money. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. If we play it right, I mean, this is presumably, you get this stuff, you're getting this. Um, they don't specify in the case who he's talking to, but presumably this is a middle management group that passes on capital spending requests. So your response would be, look, folks, if this plant is more profitable, which it will be, we're going to be able to use that to generate, to get more investment money to, to expand. Uh, we don't necessarily get to put it in our pocket because it's all part of the corporation, but it'll be a good justification. Andrew? Uh, what you could be doing with the, uh, it's kind of a question, but what you could be doing with the money you're using to do this, like isn't that captured by your discount rate essentially? Like so, we, can you just argue that? Uh, I mean, because this is kind of an opportunity cost that they're mentioning, right? I mean, instead of spending the money to do this, you could spend it to grow the business. But then you can answer like, but that's why I'm using. It is, except that in in most companies of any size, you basically do a capital budgeting process. We're going to invest X. Th I mean, you shouldn't, but you do. We're going to invest X this year. Your job is to figure out how best to invest it, as opposed to saying anything that makes that that clears the uh, uh, has a positive net present value. We'll figure out how to fund. I mean, if you have a great project, and it, I mean, and this is a way of just kind of doing a regular systematic budgeting process. If you come up with a great, big, great comma big project. Then you go to top management and you say, I know this is over the capital budget, but, but for little things like this, and for this company, this is probably a, a relatively small project, it, Darren doesn't have the discretion to do it himself. Routine things, he probably has a limit. You, can, you, can, you have a spending limit without authorization of, without approval of 20,000 maybe, maybe more. Um, for anything above that, up to some ceiling, you got to clear it with whatever this group is that are, is full of skeptics. Beyond that, the group has to go and say to top management, I know you only gave us $800,000 for the formaldehyde division, but we have this great idea and we'd like to present it. So it's, it economizes on top management time to some extent. It also um, gives you an orderly budgeting process so you can kind of predict cash flows, but it imposes this kind of constraint. I mean, capital budgeting processes do. At some point, somebody sits in the room, you know, you got a good project, I got a good project, we don't have money for both. And they're not so good that we can get money for both. We need to choose. Um, and there is a tendency to say, we want to grow. We want to grow. That is an issue faced that, the, that investments in efficiency and conservation traditionally face because they're not growth investments and people like growth. Obina? I don't know if someone mentioned this about the second point, um, but you know, it might be 2% of revenue for one plant, but what if you had several plants? The they're like this up. plant, it's 2% of revenue for all the plants, right? If you install the system at a number of plants, you could easily end up with revenue, like savings in, in the millions. You could end up with, with a good number. It would still be 2% of revenue, probably, on that order. OK, yep. No, I, I, another way to do that argument, and it's sort of a little variation on the first one, would be, um, look, guys, we can lead the way for the company whatever this group is that's approving the budget, if this works here and we're very confident it, it works, we're going to get a lot of points with the company because we led the way to 2% of revenue savings in all of our formaldehyde operations. Now, maybe it's not 2% everywhere. We've got to run the numbers. Um, Electricity is probably particularly expensive in upstate New York, would be cheaper in Ohio. But 
I, that's, where, that's where I'd go with that. I wouldn't say 2% is, 2% is, um, 2 is big if I, if I multiply it by a large number. I would say it's in our interest as the group sitting around the table to demonstrate to the guys up above that, that we, can, we can do this. Okay, here's another one. This is a killer. Our bonuses depend on compensation or on production. That's how we do it. And you're telling me it's five days of downtime and we can recover for it, recover from it. But we don't know we can recover from it. You're putting my trip to the Caribbean at risk, and it's very cold in upstate New York in the winter. I need that bonus. This is a risk. What's your response, Casey? You look ready. You're ready on this one, am I right? Well, um, first, they might be able to switch their production schedule to kind of account for taking those five days off then, because they're not running at full capacity all the time anyway. The case, the case leads you to some optimism, yes. Um, and then, I mean, additionally, you can just go back to the handy argument that businesses need to produce money, but they don't necessarily But this isn't about, this, this last point isn't about the business. It's about my trip to the Caribbean. <laughs> and I care about that. This one's tough. I don't mean to put you particularly on the spot, but this one's tough. If you've got the compensation structure set in such a way that it biases toward growth and towards revenue, this is a tough one. Charlotte? You could go back to the point that we made on the, the last objection where if you know, you're the first plant to start uh, a something that saves your company 2% in revenue and it happens at other plants, then the, organs, the heads of the organization will look favorably on you and could result in bonuses later. We can get a bigger bonus if we can sell this. Tough argument. It's one you'd try, though. David? And also, <clears throat> get a promotion if you can demonstrate initiative and larger scale thinking. And if you don't do it and someone else implements it, they might displace you. Yeah. It works for Darren. It might not work for the guys one notch above Darren. It might, though. It might. Look, if you guys all get behind this, we'll all ride up, ride up the ladder together. Martha? Um, going back to what was said about how after your investment was returned, you'll be continuing to save money, so your bonus may be less this year, but it may be much greater in future years when we're able to start expanding that growth and we're able to start. Okay, so maybe instead of going to the Caribbean this year, you go to Bale or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, but five years down the road, you can go to Jurassic Park. I don't know. <laughs> they ski in the Adirondacks instead of skiing in Vermont. I don't know. Okay. Um, anybody else? Um, how about that? The case talks about all these policies. There's this kill switch problem. Uh, there are other policies about interconnection. They're still in flux. Maybe what we ought to do is a good idea. Okay, you've sold me. It's a good idea. Why don't we just wait? Let's just let this stuff settle. You know. Maybe, they'll, maybe if we do it now, we'll have to take precautions we wouldn't have to take if they apply more sensible policies down the road. David? You could argue none of the competitors are doing it now, so doing that gives a competitive advantage versus in the future, the competitors are already like, introduced and then we're just trying to like, like catch up. But we are, but suppose the policy goes against us. Suppose instead of making it easier to interconnect, that the policy change makes it harder, requires us to put on more protective devices, or let's say $200,000 worth, uh, and then all of a sudden it's, that's, that's extreme, but, but uh, all of a sudden the policies we were counting on, the ability to sell excess power, which is still in flux at this point, um, turns out we can't sell it, turns out we need to have more protection, maybe we should wait. Claudia, what do you say? 
You sold, you sold on with the skeptics? I mean, that's not a crazy point. No. Is, it, is there a chance to like approach local regulators directly and to make it <laughs> about Well, one thing Darren might have done is he might have not necessarily approached them, but he might try to get a feel from, say, his local representative. A lot of this stuff is going on at the state level. He's running a pretty big, pretty big operation. He's one of the great polluters. That, no, one of the great, <laughs> great operations in the area. He might make a phone call and say, look, can you tell me where this stuff stands? I mean, are we going to get, we gonna, is it going to get resolved in six months? Or is this a five-year marathon and it'll get changed every so often? That matters. If it's going to get resolved in six months, let's wait. If it's, if it's going to be debated for the next 10 years, why wait? Ariana? I think this is where it would have come in useful for him to have made a more pessimistic analysis. Um, and so maybe if, if you, know, you do that first and then you say, like, OK, well, um, because I mean, when we looked at it, it looked like even if some of the um, estimates were a little bit more pessimistic, really you couldn't get the grant that you wanted, maybe, um, or you like estimated it with some of the policies not falling your way, and you could still maybe like the profit wouldn't be as large, but in the long run, it's still worth it. Then you could come and say like, look, this is what I think is going to happen. But even if I mean, you never really know, and even if it goes a little bit sour, like we still are making some kind of profit, so like it's it's worth it anyway. Okay, let me go to one last one. Who'd like to make the elevator pitch? Is there a spin he can put on this? So, so he's, he walked in with his spreadsheet. He got all these arguments, all these naysaying nitpickers. What do you stand up and say? What do you stand up and say? Caroline, are you ready with an elevator pitch here? You ready with a one-minute speech to, to make the committee turn around and charge out the door and go to the CEO and do it? Not quite ready. Okay. Anybody? Obina, you're ready today. Okay. That's good. <laughs> so, uh, sorry to disappoint you. I don't have an elevator pitch, but I'm, just, I'm curious as to what the outcome was of this case because it's just not, these aren't let really me, Let me fish one more time for an elevator pitch and then I'll, t <laughs> and then I'll tell you what I think happened which is not unrelated to that question. Max? Um, you want to appeal to the interests of the board, and their interest is obviously production and maximizing profits, so emphasizing the fact that this short-term investment will save a lot of money in the long run, which you can, in turn, invest in greater production in the future, which will give them bigger bonuses. You could also appeal, I think, for it deals with a couple of points to the safety of the workers and to the integrity of the whole plant. So no, there, in the article it talked about the ice being a hazard for the workers and the corrosion of some of the uh, structure of the building. So it's been that way as well. What I think happened, and it's not unrelated to that, my, my understanding, and I've tried to verify it, and I'll see if I can do it next time, um, is that in fact, when he presented it to the review operation, it was turned down for sort of all of those reasons. Uh, and he managed uh, to get the ear one way or another of the CEO, and he pitched it as industry leadership, green, public relations. Economics are okay. Economics are pretty good. Uh, so you don't, we're not going to lose money on this investment. But moreover, think about what we can say to the community. Think about what we can say to the workers. Think about what you can say at the next industry convention when you stand up and give your leadership speech. Um, we'll get benefits. I mean, we're venting steam. It's not hurting anybody, but it doesn't look good. It's going to look better. So he went around these guys, is my understanding, and pitched it as an opportunity, as an op and not just an economic opportunity. He, he overstated the economics. The economics are okay, but he pitched it as an opportunity, and we'll see next week, and we will see after the vacation, that whether you view something as a threat or an opportunity makes a lot of difference as to how you act on it. Thank you very much.